Okay, welcome everybody to a new origin seminar. Today we have a talk by Jason Wang, who did his PhD at the University of uh, Berkeley, where he worked on uh, astrometry, high precision astrometry with GPI. And since then he has moved on as a 51 Pegasi B fellow, and he's currently at Caltech working uh, with KPIC and doing astrometry of exoplanets with exogravity. I think he's going to give an interesting talk today. Um, please try to keep yourself uh, muted during the talk. If you have questions, please put them in the chat so that we can ask them. Um, and try to keep your uh, non-urgent questions to the end of the talk. And if you can, please turn off your video for bandwidth, for people that have low bandwidth. Thank you. And Jason, you can uh, have the floor. Great. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. And thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I know there's lots of exciting stuff happening right now. Uh, so thanks for you know, pointing your attention this way. Uh, so today, I'll talk to you about uh, two of the projects I've been working on recently uh, to characterize exoplanets using novel uh, techniques. Uh, the first one is using optical interferometry uh, with the gravity interferometer. Um, and the second one is to do high resolution spectroscopy of directly imaged exoplanets using this new instrument at Keck called KPIC. So I'll talk a little bit about both of these and some of the early science results coming out of both of these instruments. All right, um, so just some background on what I've done, but also kind of the state of the uh, field in terms of uh, exoplanet characterization is that uh, you know, with uh, just adaptive optics and chronography, we have been able to you know, detect uh, you know, a dozen or so directly imaged exoplanets. Uh, we've been able to um, you know, actually you know, obtain multiple images over time to watch these planets move and actually uh, obtain uh, orbital constraints on these planets. But uh, these planets reside at you know, pretty large separations, typically greater than 10 AU, where the orbital timescales are uh, decades to centuries. So, uh, so here are the four planets orbiting HR 8799. On the left, you see a seven-year time lapse of uh, the planets in orbital motion. You can see that the planets are only going in small orbital arcs. So uh, if you try to fit orbits, to this, these small orbital arcs, uh, you'll see these trajectories on the right here. So you can see that the orbits are still quite degenerate. Um, and just by eye, you can see that a lot of these orbits are probably uh, unphysical because uh, they kind of are overlapping with each other and crossing each other's orbits and things like that. So uh, with these small orbital arcs, uh, even with a precision down to one milli arc second, which is the best that we were, we were able to do was just single dish telescope uh, with adaptive optics and chronography, um, we're not able to, you know, uh, we're not able to fully constrain the orbits of these planets. Um, but we can do better. Um, there's you know, multiple ways to do better. So the, if you have an optical system, the spatial resolution of your optical system is really is basically lambda over D, or lambda is your operating wavelength, and D is the diameter of your telescope. Uh, so for a 10 meters telescope operating at two microns around K-band, which is typically where we detect these exoplanets, uh, you get a spatial resolution of about 40 milli arc seconds. Um, and then your astrometric precision, uh, as long as you're not um, systematics limited, really just scales as signal to noise. Uh, so your it's just lambda over d divided by SNR. Um, so for uh, the brightest exoplanets we know, or the, and the best instrumentation we have, we typically can detect these planets at an SNR about 40 or 50 or so. So essentially, our astrometric precision is about one in the arc second. Um, yeah, so uh, how, how can, so the two ways we can improve our spatial resolution is to uh, decrease our wavelengths or increase our diameter of our telescope. Uh, decreasing the wavelengths for some of these exoplanets is hard because uh, they become much fainter and uh, the glare of the host star is much more of a problem to detect. So the other thing you can do is increase the size of your telescope. So interferometry allows, uh, offers one way to do this. Um, so I just have one, uh, quick slide on just like the basics of interferometry. Uh, so if you think about uh, the double slit experiment where you shoot a laser through two slits and you create a diffraction pattern, if you just close one of those slits and shoot a laser through a single slit, uh, you get this diffraction pattern on the top here. Uh, so the first null uh, is at lambda over two big D where big D here is the diameter of a single slit, which is kind of akin to the diameter of a single telescope. Um, but then if you open up that second slit and shoot the laser through both slits and see the interference pattern, uh, then you get this uh, double slit pattern with the uh, first null at 
lambda over two little d, where little d is now the distance between the slits rather than the size of a, any individual slit. So here our angular resolution is only dependent on how far away these slits are from each other. So that's uh, basically the basic principles of how we can improve our, uh, uh, improve our angular resolution. Uh, so uh, for today, I'll be talking about the VLTI instrument. This is the uh, interferometry array consisting of the four eight meter telescopes at VLT in Chile. Uh, so the largest baseline you see here is 130 meters across. So uh, these are just eight meter telescopes, but if you combine them coherently, you can improve the angular resolution of the system by over an order of magnitude with interferometry. And the interferometer I'll be talking about today is the gravity interferometer. So this this Cryostat you see here is located in the interferometry room, um, and all the uh, beam combining and stuff happens inside this cryostat. Um, I'd just like to mention one really key piece of technology that's really made ex uh, interferometry of uh, well long baseline interferometry of exoplanets possible, and that's uh, that's using this technique called reference star interferometry. Uh, so typically, when you hear about combining light from multiple telescopes. Um, you usually have to um, uh, usually is usually to measure you know, stellar diameters or you know resolve you know exos zodiacal light that's on axis. Uh, this is because you need uh, a really bright star to do interferometry. Typically, um, if you have you know two telescopes, they uh, the light from the, your your star and your planets go through different patches of the atmosphere. Um, which means that they travel uh, because they kind of refract through the atmosphere. They travel different distances. Uh, so that when you try to combine the light coherently, it won't combine coherently because uh, uh, they are no longer coherent because they've traveled different distances. So what you have to do is uh, correct for this optical path difference. Um, and because the atmosphere changes quite fast, the atmosphere is turbulent on millisecond time scales, uh, you really have to operate uh, uh, what's called fringe tracking at kilohertz time scales. So you basically need to correct for the differential path between two, two different telescopes at every millisecond or so. And you can only collect so many photons every millisecond. So really fringe tracking has been limited to pretty bright objects. So KMAG 11 to magnitude or brighter. Um, so none of the directly imaged exoplanets we know of uh, have are this bright. So we're basically, we, we, we couldn't have done reference star inter, we couldn't have done long baseline interferometry of exoplanets before because these, um, these exoplanets are just too faint to be the fringe tracker. But what's different about gravity is that we can actually use the exoplanet host star as a fringe tracker and have uh, gravity has a second interferometer, a second science spectrometer that allows us to integrate for uh, you know, many seconds to go down to a K magnitude of 18 or so. So this allows us to basically use the bright star to correct for the differential uh, path differences due to the atmosphere and then uh, correct for those on the science spectrometer so that we can get coherent fringes on the exoplanet if we integrate for many seconds. Um, this uh, not only requires this uh, reference star, to, to make this reference star interferometry possible, you don't, you, you don't just correct for the atmosphere, you also need very precise instrument calibration. The, uh, the optics in the system also expand and contract on you know, very short time scales. So uh, gravity has a bunch of metrology systems that are required to basically correct for the fact that the fringe tracker and the science spectrometer aren't seeing the same optical paths and you need to correct for the fact that uh, you know, one of these is contracting, the other one might be ex expanding. So you need to, uh, base, you have to correct for uh, not only uh, optical path differences due to the atmosphere, but also due to the instrument itself. Um, but uh, this has been made possible with gravity. And this really was the key that allowed us to make the first detection of an exoplanet long, first detection of an exoplanet using long baseline interferometry. Um, so what you see here are the HR 8799 planets again. And the planet that we observed was HR 8799E. It's the innermost planet in the system. So we definitely didn't start out with the easiest one, uh, but nevertheless, it works. Uh, so here you can see that the, the detection of the planet and also the uh, astrometric precision that we can place on the precision of, uh, on the position of the planet. So uh, one thing immediately you can see is that the, the tick label is here. There's one milliard seconds on the x-axis, half a milliard second on the y-axis. Uh, we're able to obtain down to uh, you know, 50 micro arc second precision on the positions of these exoplanets. And that's really because of this order of magnitude improvement in the um, angular resolution of the optical system that really allows us to make this possible. 
uh, to really make that clear, here's a, a bit of an interferometry diagram, but if you bear with me, uh, I think it basically it explains, you know, you know, why we have this really amazing precision. So uh, this is a UV diagram. So U is the Fourier transform of RA and V is a Fourier transform of VEC. So uh, higher U's means higher spatial frequencies or a uh, probe in smaller scales. Uh, same thing with higher V uh, in absolute magnitude. Um, so if you had a conventional circular 10 meter telescope in K-band, the spatial frequencies that you cover uh, in the UV plane by a conventional 10 meter telescope is uh, enclosed in this blue circle. Um, if you had a hypothetical 130 meter telescope operating in K-band, circular 130, thir circular 130 meter telescope, the UV coverage of that optical system would be everything enclosed in this dotted red circle. Um, Obviously, we don't have a 130 meter telescope. So, uh, but what we do have with our VLTI observations with gravity is that we can probe these spatial frequencies. So you can see that along this axis, we are achieving spatial we are achieving spatial resolutions comparable to a 130 meter telescope. On this uh, on the shorter axis, we are achieving worse position because we don't have these long baselines, and that really is why you see these error bars here. We have much tighter error bars. In the radio in the RA direction, and we have larger error bars in the declination direction. So um, now that we've demonstrated that um, uh, exo directly imaged exoplanets are possible with uh, gravity, uh, we're starting this program called Exogravity. Um, it's a uh, it's a large program at ESO. It's a fourteen night program over the next two over the next two years. Uh, our goal is basically to tar target everyone's favorite like top ten high contrast directly imaged exoplanets. Um, the goal is to obtain 10 to 100 micro arc second astrometric monitoring of these planets over multiple epochs so we can constrain their orbits to uh, you know, extremely tight precision, way better than what can be done with conventional imaging. Uh, we also are, uh, are obtaining an RF 500 K-band spectral library because gravity is not only just, gravity is also a spectrometer. So in addition just to obtain the position of these planets, we also get a, a K-band spectra of these planets. So our, goes to obtain a uniform K-band spectra. In K-band, you can detect uh, molecules like uh, carbon monoxide, uh, methane, and water, which allows us to measure abundances and you know, really study these planetary atmospheres in detail. Um, so today, I'll just talk about a couple uh, recent results from gravity. Um, so the, the first one is uh, using gravity to study the PDS-70 protoplanets, which uh, some, some people here at Arizona are probably uh, quite familiar with. Um, so this is a two-planet uh, system. There's a PDS-70B here and PDS-70C. Um, this, this system is interesting because it's really the, uh, the only directly imaged system where we have a clear detection of protoplanets that are still accreting. Uh, so here you can see a faint outline of the protoplanetary disk. This is the, the rim. This is the front rim of the protoplanetary disk, but these two protoplanets are orbiting in, the, in this cavity that they've cleared out. Um, one of the things is, uh, you know, B initially was discovered by Sphere. It was a very clear detection because you see it residing in the cavity. Um, whereas PDS-70C is really, you know, really at the edge of this disk rim. So it was really hard to determine that this was a, a protoplanet until Sebastian you know, uh, observed there was Muse at H alpha and gave us this really clear detection of both B and C that really showed us that you know, there wasn't just one protoplanet in the system. There are two uh, massive accretion protoplanets in the system. Um, so we uh, observed the system with gravity. Uh, we obtained uh, two epochs of, a, uh, of observations for each of the protoplanets that allows us to constrain their orbits. I'll say that with just two epochs, the orbital constraints aren't super great yet. Essentially, what we've done is constrain the instantaneous position and velocity of these planets to gravity level precision, but the orbital acceleration and, and ultimately the orbital elements are still dependent on the previous imaging astrometry that's somewhere between a factor of 10 to 100 times worse than our astrometry. So uh, the orbital constraints are, aren't super tight yet, but even that, uh, but still uh, with these two gravity epochs, we're able to show that PDS-70B uh, has to be slightly eccentric. Uh, it has a, just a slight eccentricity of E about 0.1 to 0.2. And this is actually um, fits very nicely in this picture that uh, uh, these two planets uh, Kind of convert convergently migrated into res, mean motion resonance into a two to one mean motion resonance, and if you were if you do that while uh, 
still in a gas disk, you expect the eccentricities uh, to be pumped. So uh, this uh, non-zero eccentricity for PS70B is uh, quite consistent with this picture uh, provided by Bay et al. in this uh, 2019 paper. Uh, like I said, uh, gravity is also a K-band spectrometer. So we're able to obtain uh, K-band spectra of these exoplanets. Um, well, and our conclusion is that um, we're actually seeing atmosphere shrouded by dust. So I think um, previously before the gravity observations were made, um, you can see the, the previous archival spectra and, um, and photometry are still pretty consistent with a black body. So uh, it wasn't clear that we were actually seeing into the planet's atmosphere. It might be just, we might just be seeing all this dust that's kind of accreting onto the planet that's hot. Uh, and maybe that's what we're seeing. But I think now it's, it's, it, it seems like the best fits, especially with this K-band slope, is that we're, we're not, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a black body anymore. It's actually a atmosphere that's shrouded uh, by dust. So if you just fit a regular atmospheric model to this data, it doesn't fit very well at all. But if you add some amount of extinction to it um, by some sort of dust, we aren't, aren't able to characterize exactly what this, these dust properties are yet with the current measurement precision. Um, but it does seem like these are the, it does seem like, you know, some sort of extincted planetary atmosphere is, is, the, is what we're seeing uh, for in, in the emission of the spectra of these planets. Um, I'll mention that there's no clear evidence of circumplanetary disk emission uh, in the near infrared spectra. Um, there have been a, there has been a millimeter detection of uh, circumplanetary dust material around PDSMDC in the millimeter, but uh, it doesn't appear like we see any evidence of that in the near infrared, which likely means that that dust is probably pretty cool or uh, just uh, pretty compact. Just, we just, yeah, there's no significant evidence of an infrared excess due to it. Um, lastly, we tried this pretty cool experiment. Um, uh, we tried to actually spatially resolve the protoplanets. So like I said, uh, gra gravity, because we have these 130 meter baselines, we can achieve spatial resolutions uh, down to, you know, uh, a milli arc second or so. So what we, what we did is uh, basically measure uh, what's called the visibility as a function of baseline. So if you have a perfect point source, you expect the visibility to stay constant as a function of baselines because you're not resolving the source. It's, uh, uh, if you go to higher and higher angular resolutions, it still looks like a point source. Uh, if you had a resolved object, uh, you'd see the visibility drop as you go to longer and longer baselines. And uh, as you can see, our error bars are still pretty big because it's pretty hard to do these observations for a very faint exoplanet. But uh, what we find is that both uh, for PDS-70B and for PDS-70C, the emission is consistent with a single compact point source we don't detect any circumplanetary disk. If it was a fairly bright circumplanetary disk, uh, say about 10% uh, the brightness of the planet in K-band, we can place an upper limit about 0.3 AU on the size of that circumplanetary disk. This is corresponds to about 0.1 uh, Bondi radii, which is about what we expect based on theory on how large a circumplanetary disk should, should be. So the upper limits we place are, are consistent with the models. Um, Hopefully, as we can get some more data, we can tighten these error bars and maybe make some better constraints on the actual spatial sizes of these protoplanets. Um, the second object uh, system I'll talk about is the Beta Pictora system. Uh, so this is uh, you know, quite a famous directly imaged system. Uh, first, uh, the debris disk around Beta Pictoris was discovered. So it's like a Kuiper Belt analog. Um, it's an edge on debris disk. And you can see that there's actually, it's, there's some deviations from pure edge on. There's this uh, warp where this left side is offset to, to the bottom and the right side is offset to the top. And when people detected this warp, uh, they you know, hypothesized that a planet on a slightly inclined orbit would be driving this warp. And indeed in 2010, Amory Lagrange detected beta pictoris B. And through you know, uh, many years of astrometric monitoring, we've determined that you know, beta pic B is indeed consistent with uh, you know driving the warp in the system, so this is a nice uh, system where uh, planet disk planet disk interactions kind of work out quite nicely. Um, this is the second planet that we observed with gravity. Uh, so this was published in, back in 2020. We made the first detection of Beta Pic B with gravity. Uh, uh, with just a single epoch with gravity, we can already again start seeing non-zero eccentricity uh, for Beta Pic B. Um, but I think from the first paper, what's really remarkable is the spectrum that we obtained with gravity on beta pic B. I think this is probably one of the best exoplanet spectra taken to date. 
Um, so this is the K-band spectra. Uh, what you're seeing in black is the data and blue and in purple is the model. Uh, so in the short end of K-band, you're seeing water absorption here. And then in the, in the red end K-band, you're seeing this is the CO absorption bands. And I think what's really remarkable, you can, you can actually see individual absorption bands that are predicted by the model in our data. We have uh, you know, very high signal to noise detections in individual spectral channels for beta pic B. Um, because we're able to measure both water and carbon monoxide, we can actually place constraints on the atmospheric abundance, uh, the elemental abundances in the atmosphere. We see a, a sub subsolar CDL ratio of point of 0.44. Um, I'll say that it's it's subsolar because we don't know what the stellar C to O ratio is. Uh, Beta Pic is a uh, young Delta Scuti eight zero star. There is uh, it's been it's hard to measure elemental abundances. I think particularly of oxygen, oxygen abundance is uh, unknown for um, Beta Pic. But um, since it's a young moving group star, it's probably likely near solar is our guess. So if that's so if, if indeed the stellar C to O ratio is also uh, near solar, then it has a substellar C to O, which would probably uh, require um, would, would require some uh, uh, planetesimal enrichment after these planets have formed in order to produce some sort of C to O like this. Um, this system got a lot more interesting uh, when we detected a beta pictoris, uh, when beta pictoris C was discovered uh, in radio velocities by Anne Maria Lagrange. So this is a, a proposed nine Jupiter mass inner planet at around three AU. Um, um, this was a pretty heroic effort, I would say, because like I said, beta, beta, uh, beta pic is a A0 delta scuti star. So removing all those stellar pulsations with limited number of lines that you could measure, uh, and still obtain, you know, like 100 meter per second, uh, better than 100 meter per second precision on the real velocities itself is already very impressive. Um, so with this rate of velocity planet, we could predict exactly when this planet would be at maximum elongation. We uh, can assume that it's nearly coplanar to uh, beta pick uh, B, because otherwise uh, it would dynamically disturb the debris disk and we should be able to see evidences of that. Um, and we can place the fiber of gravity at the location that we expect. And sure enough, we actually detected beta pic C. So this is the first direct detection of a radial velocity discovered planet. So here you can see the gravity measurements. So we first detected it uh, February 9th of 2020. We actually observed it two days later just to make sure we detected it. And we can actually detect orbital motion just within two nights of observation. And this orbital motion was going in exactly the right trajectory, which gave us in improved confidence that we actually detected this planet. Um, we had a third epoch uh, a month later, just to confirm everything a bit better. Um, and you can see um, we have some, some very nice detections with uh, obtaining astrometric precision down to you know, 0.1 million arc seconds, 100 micro arc seconds on beta pictoris C. Uh, so I think this is really exciting because this is a planet where we dynamically measured the mass. We can uh, also measure the luminosity uh, in spectra of this planet. Uh, however, the initial spectrum is uh, pretty inconclusive, I would say. So here's the K-band spectra of beta pic C from gravity. Um, uh, the, in gray are the data points, and in blue and orange are some um, best fit models. You can see that the models predict small uh, molecular absorption bands, uh, but because you know, this planet is quite challenging to detect, uh, it's at about 4 times 10 to the minus 5 contrast at 130 milliarc seconds. Um, this is a factor times three closer than any other directly imaged exoplanet. Like uh, most of the other exoplanets reach, uh, you know, 300, 400 million arc seconds in angular separation where we have much less starlight to subtract here. You know, the, the best we can do is 130 million arc seconds in angular separation from the star. Uh, so we're, we have a lot of stellar glare that we have to remove uh, coherently with gravity. And this makes these observations challenging. But we're, our goal is to, you know, get more data, hopefully beat down these error bars and uh, try to make some better atmospheric constraints. Um, but still, even this, this detection gives us, gives us a K-band luminosity, gives, at least gives us a K-band flux. Um, and with beta pic B and C having both dynamically measured masses and, um, uh, and empirical luminosity measurements, we can you know, compare them to predictions based on core accretion models. And you can see that uh, both the empirically measured masses and luminosities are consistent with uh, the core accretion scenario. 
Uh, one thing you can see here is that the mass error bars are still quite large. Uh, so one thing we'll, uh, we are actually doing is dynamically measuring the masses of these planets with gravity alone. Um, so how do you do this? Um, so essentially, if you have a multi-planet system, the planets actually perturb the orbits of one another. Um, so when we measure the orbit of beta pick B relative to the star, um, or, or, or what we're measuring is that relative separation. So if you have an inner planet in the system, uh, beta pick C is going to cause the star to wobble. So when you measure the separation between beta pick B and the star, you'll see, in, in addition to beta pick B orbital motion, you'll see a wobble due to the star. And this uh, ripple, if you look at it face on, if you were able to fly face on over to the, uh, look at the, the plane of the beta pick uh, B system, you would see basically these epicycles created uh, on the visual orbit of beta pick B due to the existence of beta pick C in motion. Um, these epicycles are, you can see roughly one milli arc second in amplitude with just direct imaging alone, we probably wouldn't have the astrometric precision sufficient to really re detect confidently these, uh, this, these, this epicycle. But with gravity, because we're able to achieve angular uh, astrometric precisions down to 50 micro arc seconds, we can actually detect this. Um, and this is some really preliminary stuff uh, based on the observations we just took. So uh, everything here is still preliminary, um, but if, uh, if we fit, beta pick B plus beta pick C and subtract off the Keplerian motion of beta pick B on its own orbit, uh, we, we are left with these residuals on the orbit of beta pick B. Uh, and what you can see is that there's this additional sinusoid motion. This sinusoid motion will be due to the reflex motion of beta pick C caused onto the, onto the visual orbit of beta pick B. And this ref the amplitude of this reflex motion allows us to directly measure the mass of beta pick B, not beta pick B of beta pick C, giving us uh, a mass of about eight Jupiter masses. Uh, everything's in tilde here still because the data analysis is ongoing. But uh, this is really exciting because without using the radial velocities, without using Gaia hyperparticles, which each have their own systematics, uh, we're able to use gravity alone to directly uh, dynamically measure the masses of uh, one of these planets in the beta pictoris system. Um, so this, so this is some pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff that I'm currently working on. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask me uh, more questions about this later. Um, but that's uh, essentially uh, some of the highlights from the Excel Gravity program so far to date. Um, so here are essentially all the systems that we published so far. We have uh, the first detection of a planet with gravity using H on, on hri 79 e And then we published a suite of papers on beta pick on the beta pick system because it's gotten pretty interesting with now with two planets in it. Uh, and then we also published a paper on the PDS-70 protoplanet system where we study uh, the protoplanets with gravity. And I'll, I'll just mention that there's a lot more planets coming soon, so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, so for the second half of this talk, I'll focus on uh, KPIC. So uh, KPIC is the Keck Planet Imager and Characterizer. Um, and uh, KPIC is, uh, although I'll say it's a small instrument physically in size, uh, we have you know, quite a large international collaboration of people that have helped uh, with this instrument. Um, it's led out Caltech by Dimitri Mawe uh, and Nam Jovanovic. Uh, you can see you know, we have uh, collaborators from you know, all across the world um, with the main funding provided us to, to us by NSF and the Heising Science Foundation. Um, so uh, one of the questions we get a lot is uh, what exactly is KPIC? Um, I, I typically call it just a new instrument for Keck for simplicity. Uh, but what, what it really is is a series of upgrades to the Keck 2 AO suite. We're not actually adding any new science instrument in the back end, but we are modifying how these science instruments operate. Um, so here's kind of a cartoon optical diagram for Keck, the Keck 2 telescope. So you have the primary mirror here, you have the deformable mirrors so of the adaptive optic system here, and this is the facility wavefront sensor. So if you're just doing regular natural guide star adaptive optics, um, this is where the facility wavefront sensor would be. Um, and what we've added is a new infrared pyramid wavefront sensor. So instead of doing wavefront sensing in the visible, we're doing wavefront sensing at uh, J and H band. Um, what this allows us um, uh, is that we can study much redder stars. Um, this allows us to study protoplanetary stars around brown dwarfs. And this is really uh, allows us to do better 
imaging with NERF2. I won't really talk about that today. Um, I'll give you a, actually I'll talk, uh, right, I, I have a couple slides on this actually. Uh, so the infrared pyramid wavefront sensor uh, allows us to go do natural guide star on objects that otherwise are too red for uh, visible natural guide star AO. So we're able to lock our natural guide star AO system on a binary brown dwarf. So this is a two mass uh, 0746 is a binary brown dwarf with an H mag of 11, but an R mag of 18. So we go out of, out of the realm for natural guide star AO for indivisible. Um, another nice thing about the infrared pyramid wavefront sensor is because it's operating much closer uh, and in wavelengths, uh, compared to the uh, visible light wavefront sensor, we think we do better in terms of NCPA compensation. Uh, so here is uh, TW Hydra observed with the Shack Hartman and then with the infrared pyramid wavefront sensor. You can see that we seem to clean up a lot more uh, of the residual stellar glare close into the star. I'll note that this is from two completely different nights. So the comparison isn't exactly apples to apples. Uh, but I think we've been we're starting to see this trend now, where the the pyramid wave, for instance, actually does better close into the star because of uh, better uh, NCP compensation. Um, yeah, so we use this to observe the PS70 protoplanets, um, B and C. Uh, sorry for the the caption. Um, in in L band, we obtained uh, actually the best L band images of these planets uh, from Keck, which is uh, pretty remarkable because because of the uh, elevation limits, uh, how high up PS70 is from Keck, we're only able to observe it for about an hour and a half at most any night. So this was about one hour a day that we were able to obtain these very nice detections of both uh, B and C. And we use this to constrain the overall luminosities of these planets to help uh, uh, compare that to models to constrain the masses and the accretion rates of these planets. Uh, but today, um, I'll really be focusing on the fiber injection unit, which I think is really unique to KPIC. Uh, so here, uh, what we do instead is guide the light of the AL system uh, into uh, this thing called the FIU or fiber injection unit, which then feeds the light of a, a faint exoplanet into a single mode fiber that we feed into the nurse spec high resolution spectrograph. So this is a R about 30 to 35,000 K and L band spectrograph. Uh, so that was, this allows us to obtain high resolution spectra directly image exoplanets. Um, so high resolution um, is pretty interesting in many different ways. Uh, first, we're able to detect the individual molecular lines, and this allows us to directly measure molecular abundances, uh, which uh, allows us to constrain composition. Uh, second, um, because at high uh, spectral resolution, we can actually measure uh, the Doppler shift of these lines. We can actually measure the rate of velocity of the planet itself, which allows us to constrain the orbit of the planet. And we can measure the uh, rotational broadening of these uh, of these lines, the V sine I broadening of these lines to measure the the spin of these planets. Um, and lastly, for the for the brightest companions, where uh, our hope is to do what's called Doppler mapping of the system. So basically, as these planets rotate, um, you will see different parts of the surfaces. Some parts are brighter, some parts are darker. This will cause changes in the line spread function of these lines. So the the shape of the line spread function will actually change over time. And we can try to use this to infer what the surfaces of the atmospheres of these uh, companions look like. Um, yeah, so the, one of the key things about KPIC is using single mode fibers to do high resolution spectroscopy. Uh, one, the key reason to do this rather than to use a conventional slit is because we're trying to do spectroscopy as something that's really faint next to something that's really bright. And you really wanna minimize the scatter, scatter starlight from the bright host star. So this is an image of HR8799, HR8799 without post-processing. All the stuff you see here is the scatter, scatter starlight. There's four planets hidden in there here that you wouldn't be able to see, basically. Um, if you want to observe, say, uh, HR8799C, which is about 0.9 uh, arc seconds from the star, uh, if you place a slit here, you'd be uh, you know, collecting all of this diffracted starlight from the star, which will make it hard just because from a stellar photon noise point of view, but also you have to sift through all of these stellar photons to try to see where the planet is. With a single mode fiber, we're able to essentially place the fiber at the location of the star, at, at the location of the planet, sorry. Um, single mode fiber has an angular size about 50 milli arc seconds or so, which is exactly the size of the PSF of the planet. So essentially we're only coupling in light at the location of the planet. 
Um, in addition, the sigma wall fiber allows for some starlight rejection. We expect that about a factor of three of the starlight won't be coupled efficiently into the fiber because the fiber only allows a single mode of propagation. And uh, generally, the, the speckles in the field uh, aren't, uh, you know, aren't parallel to that mode. Um, yeah, so for HR8799, um, again, here are the four plants. But like I said, this is what the raw data looks like. Uh, these images that you might be accustomed to seeing for the HR8799 planets, these are made from you know, post-process images where we took an hour of data, remove the stellar glare and stack them together to really see the planets clearly. And when we were operating our fiber injection unit, we had to place the fiber on the planet using an image that looks like this. So as you expect, this is uh, quite challenging. This is one of the technical challenges of KPIC. Um, I'll just give you a kind of cartoon about how this all works. Um, so here we have what was called a tracking camera. So here's kind of the field of view of our tracking camera in this rectangle. Um, and here are the locations of our five science fibers. So if you want light injected into the spectrograph, you got to place an object on one of these science fibers. Uh, our tracking camera operates at H-band. Uh, so uh, you can see the star here in H-band. That's uh, you, basically all you can see. You don't see any planets. Um, however, our science spectrograph operates at K and L-band. And because the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere is a prism, uh, the, the position of the star at each of these bands is actually different. We don't currently have an atmospheric dispersion corrector. We're adding that hopefully later this year so that this tracking operation will be a little bit simpler and also improve our coupling. But right now, uh, if you see a star in H band here, the star is gonna be here in K band and here in L band. Uh, so if you want to couple in K-band light from the star, you got to place the star offset from one of these fibers so that the K-band light of the star couples into this fiber. Uh, next, uh, if you have a companion, uh, you have to know the separation and position angle of this planet companion roughly to within about 10 milliard seconds uh, before the observations. Uh, so someone has to do an, essentially an orbit fit or some, some sort of prediction to, see, to know exactly where this companion, companion should be. Um, and then we don't see it on our tracking camera. So if you see the star here and you know the planet should be here uh, in H band, then you can guess that the planet should be or infer that the planet should be here in K band and here in L band. So if you want to place the planet uh, on one of these fibers, you got to place the star, you got to operate the tip tilt mirror to place the star on your field of view at this location, such as the such that in H band, such as the K band light of the companion gets coupled into this fiber. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, this is a little bit tricky. It's what we call blind offsetting, um, and we tested this uh, quite extensively, and it now works quite well. Um, so here uh, is one of the experiments we did. We observed a stellar binary uh, where we can actually see the secondary companion, so we can actually validate that we're actually placing the companion at the right location. And you can see here where we blink between these two images, where we offset the offset the star. It actually does work. Uh, we're able to off, uh, offset the star out to about two and a half arc seconds, but uh, roughly was less than 10% loss in light due to fiber misalignment. So like, we think this is working quite well now, uh, but this has definitely been one of the challenging parts of KPIC. Uh, so now uh, talking more about how we do uh, obtain the spectra of these planets. Um, so here's uh, you know, how uh, the observations of HR, the HR8799 planets were made. So we have you know, multiple fibers during these operations, only four of the fibers were operational, uh, but you can see this is, we place one fiber at the location of the, of the planet, which couples in both planet and starlight. And then we have three other fibers that are placed across the field of view, coupling only starlight. Uh, so then these fibers feed into the nurse spec spectrograph. So I show, show just a small cutout of the detector here. You see two shell orders, and in each shell order, you see four different fibers. Uh, these are these fibers correspond to these four fibers on the sky. See this one on the top is this furthest out fiber from the star. The second one is the one that's coupling in both planet and starlight. This is the one we're really interested in. But then we have these other three fibers that gives us simultaneous spectra of the star for calibration. And this is uh, really useful because we can actually use the star only spectra plus planet atmospheric models to fit the data directly. So we don't actually have to uh, fit our data in cross-correlation space like has been done for many other high-resolution spectro uh, spectroscopy programs. Uh, we can actually fit the, uh, the 1D extractive spectra from our spectrograph. So in black here is the data. 
And in teal is the Ford model, which we decomposed into the stellar model in blue and the planet model in red. So for HRC99D, well, you can see that even though that the, the, the star is about 10 times brighter than the planet, we can actually fit both of these simultaneously and um, and you know, vary things in the planetary model, like the effective temperature, the gravity, the V sin i, things like that, to fit for the planet properties. Um, but because CC uh, cross correlation functions are nice to show detections, um, I'll just show one cross correlation function here, just to show that we detected all of these planets or tentatively detected them. Um, so this is the cross correlation signal to noise for a water plus carbon monoxide template. So assuming an atmosphere that has both water absorption and carbon monoxide absorption uh, as a function of rate of velocity shift. So we expect that about zero shift, you expect a peak in the cross correlation function due to the presence of the planets. And at, at other uh, shifts, if you shift the molecular template to other positions, you won't detect the, the planets because the, the template doesn't match the data. Um, so you can see we have very nice detections of the inner three planets, planets C, D, and E. This is the first detections of D and E at high spectral resolution are greater than 10,000. Uh, this is the second detection of HRA799C, uh, but we have obtained two times better SNR using four times less integration time. So it shows you kind of the, the benefits of KPEC in this regard. Um, we also have a very tentative detection of B. This is the SNR3. So you know you can believe it for what with whatever confidence you trust SNR3 detections. Um, but otherwise, we have really nice detections of the inner three planets, which really demonstrates the high contrast capabilities of KPIC, being able to detect these planets when the stellar glare is an order of magnitude brighter than the star and than the planet. So, like I said, we're able to fit the data directly, and this allows us to basically, you know, fit uh, these spectra like any other exoplanet spectra in likelihood space. So we can obtain, uh, obtain nice posteriors on the bulk properties of these planets at higher spectral resolution. Uh, we can constrain their effective temperatures and log Gs. Um, I'll put a little asterisk around this because there's not very many uh, planetary atmospheric models available at these high spectral resolutions. Um, there's definitely like these planets have already have a history of being challenging to fit. Excuse me. And I believe some of the newer atmospheric models are doing a better job of fitting these, the atmospheres of these planets, but um, they aren't available at, at these resolutions are of 30,000 or so. So we haven't been able to, to fit them yet. So that's uh, some of the work that needs to be done in the future is uh, getting better high resolution atmospheric models to fit these planetary data. Um, we're able to also measure the radio velocities of these planets. Uh, so in gray is the approximate uh, stellar radio velocity. I say approximate because the radio velocity of the star is unknown to about a one to two kilometers per second. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, radio velocities of the planets that we measure is consistent with orbital predictions. Uh, because the system is nearly face, face on, we don't, we don't expect a very high rate of velocity for these, for these planets. So um, these probably isn't the best example of constraining planetary orbits with the rate of velocities. If we had a more edge on orbit, you could, you, we'd expect you know, tens of 10 kilometer per second deviations essentially from the star, which would be much stronger, easier to detect. Um, we also detect uh, rotation rates. So we detect that the, the lines from these planets are broadened, especially for the inner two planets, D and E, we detect a, uh, a pretty significant uh, bro rotational broadening. Uh, this V sine I of 10 to 15 kilometers per second um, corresponds to a rotation period of somewhere between four to 12 hours. There's a very large range because the obliquity of these planets are, are quite unknown. Um, so we have to remove the sine I degeneracy and the sine I degener degeneracy this depends on what you assume about the inclination of the spin axis of these planets. Uh, if you assume these planets form this like via core accretion without too much stuff going on, then you'd assume that the, the planet's spin axes are roughly aligned with their orbital inclinations. If that's true, then you'd, you'd expect somewhere between a four to five hour rotation period for these planets. Um, but, um, I, there's been really no constraints on planetary ubiquity. I think um, if these planets formed via gravitational instability, or if uh, somehow the spin orbital coupling between uh, these planets that which are in resonance lock somehow excited uh, the obliquities of these planets, uh, they could be at other obliquities, which could uh, 
imply much longer rotation periods for these plants. So it's uh, the cyanide degeneracy is still somewhat unknown. Um, but I think one way to really resolve some of these things is to look more at a population uh, of these plants and measure the B cyanide over a, a large population. So our, we have, uh, we're, now that KPIC is working, we're starting this high resolution spectroscopic survey of 33 substellar companions accessible to Keck. Uh, the goal is really probe a bunch of different formation regimes. So probing uh, companions, there are two massive be formed for, via core accretion and, form, and probing companions that are uh, low in mass, which likely have to have formed via core accretion. It's looking for differences in the spin as a function of mass, but also looking at plants that formed inside the circumstellar disk and looking at plants that formed outside the circumstellar disk and seeing if there are any changes in the rotation or composition of these plants due to uh, their formation location. Um, and this ship will be augmented also by uh, what we call KPIC phase two. This is a series of upgrades coming to KPIC in the next year or so uh, that will hopefully improve the high contrast performance of KPIC further. Uh, Two of the things just to improve our throughput. So in high resolution, the name of the game is really to uh, collect as many photons as possible. So we're adding in an atmospheric dispersion corrector and what's called a, uh, a PIA, but it's basically a beam shaping optic that allows us to better couple the planet light into the single mode fiber. This should improve our throughput of our observations. We're also adding in high order deformable mirror to allow us to do this technique called speckle nulling at the location of fiber. We know exactly where the planet is. So all we wanna do is basically throw away all the light of the star at the location of the planet. If we can throw it away to other parts of the focal plane, that's okay, because we really are just care about that one particular position on at the location of the planet. And lastly, we'll be testing some new experimental modes. Uh, one of them uh, is this new fiber nulling technique that we call vortex fiber nulling. Uh, what this allows us to do is to kind of uh, distort the shape of the stellar PSF so that it doesn't it, to, it doesn't couple into the plant into the single mode fiber at all and that if you if there were planets at say half a lambda over d or one lambda over d from the star they would they would couple light into this into the single mode fiber whereas the plant whereas the star will not so basically trying to push into much closer angular separations uh, by combining high resonance spectroscopy and uh, fiber nulling interferometry to uh, to probe uh, planets at smaller angular separations. Um, yeah, and lastly, I just wanted to share this one little cool web tool I made. Uh, this is called Where is the Planet? And one of the things uh, that's common to both KPIC and gravity is that both of these instruments are single mode fiber based instruments. Uh, we need to know the location of the planet uh, to order of magnitude 10 million arc second localization. We can tolerate quite a bit more if you're willing to take a loss in throughput, but if you want like the best coupling into the fiber, you want to know the positions of these planets to 10 million arc seconds or better. So what I've done is try to compile a bunch of different orbit fits from the literature uh, into this nice little web app so that you can, you know, any night during your observation, you can just pick your favorite planet that you're interested in observing and it will predict the location of the planet uh, and give you uncertainties over how well that location is known. Um, yeah, so that's basically all I had. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, thanks. For, thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. All right, thank you so much, Jason. Um, if you have a question, you can either use the raise hand feature to ask your question live, or you can put a question in the chat. Uh, so I see we have a question from Yifan in the chat who says, great talk. The capabilities of gravity and KIPEC are mind boggling. What spectral features drive the log G difference between the fit of HR 8799E versus B, C, and D? Yeah, so um, this is a great question. So this is something um, I'm trying to figure out whether this is, I, I don't think this is real because we believe that the log Gs of all of these planets should be somewhere in the 3.5 to four range. Uh, but rather, I think this is a limitation in the models. Uh, so these four models, we only can vary effective temperature and log G, but if there are other things like, uh, you know, compositional differences or, you know, where, where the clouds should be, uh, like in the planet's atmosphere, that could change the depths of the lines. And essentially, uh, as you change log G, the, the depths of the lines change. So uh, what, what we're seeing here might be some of these other effects that require tuning other parameters, but because these four models 
uh, we can only F2 and affect the temperature log G right now. Um, there are other four models that you can do uh, do more with, and like with retrievals, we can do more with, but the, this is kind of our first shot of fitting these high resolution data. So we wanted to fit something that had low dimensionality. But so I think that the, the log G differences are really, my guess currently is, is due to model systematics and due to the fact that there are other knobs to tune the models that we would like to tune, but we're not tuning right now. All right. Um, next question is from John Najita, who says, thanks for the fantastic, fascinating presentation. Can you say more about why the single mode fiber preferentially rejects light from stellar speckles? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, basically, the single mode fiber kind of prefers uh, like a Gaussian. Uh, I'm oversimplifying it a bit, uh, but the single mode fiber generally just prefers like a Gaussian looking PSF. Uh, so you have like a Gaussian looking PSF at the location of the single mode fiber, then it'll couple quite nicely into the single mode fiber. Um, and you have deviations from that Gaussianity, then it will deviate. In particular, speckles uh, generally aren't Gaussian. They are, you know, very elongated, they're spread out. And uh, something that I haven't mentioned is that they're at different phases. Um, they're the, uh, so basically, essentially, uh, the, if you decompose the modes uh, of what a speckle is at the location of the focal plane, most of that, most of those modes aren't in, uh, most of that power isn't in the first mode, it's in the higher order modes, basically, so, and those modes don't get coupled into the single mode fiber, whereas a planet PSF, which looks roughly like an airy disk, most of that power is in that first mode, which gets coupled into the uh, single mode fiber. All right, uh, next question is from Andrew, if you want to unmute yourself. Sure, yeah, Jason, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I was interested, uh, I wonder if you could explain a little more how you said that um, planetary spins and obliquities uh, might be um, related to formation mechanism. I mean, on, on that, I thought I'd comment that I, I know for the case of the solar system, obliquities are, you know, significantly affected by orbital resonances that, you know, don't have an obvious connection to formation mechanism. So I yeah, was just curious yeah. if you could explain a little bit more what you meant. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're targeting stuff much younger, you know, somewhere between the 1 and 50 million year range. So, like, I know some of the spin orbit resonance in the solar system take, you know, quite a long time to develop. So, um, if we're, I'm thinking more like uh, initial conditions can affect um, the, the obliquities, like if you have a really uh, turbulent disk and you have a gravitational collapse that forms a planet, you don't expect necessarily that, the, the spin axis of that uh, planet that formed would be aligned with the spin axis of the, or the rotation uh, axis of the circumplanetary circumstellar disk. Um, so it's, it's merely a hypothesis at this point. I'm still, I'm, I'm interested if uh, people are, it'd be nice if, uh, you know, if there are some more studies on this and really kind of probe this a bit more. I, I think I've been looking, I was trying to find in the literature whether we could constrain uh, the obliquities of the HR-89 planets at all, given their orbits and their, you know, uh, their ages and things like that, but I haven't been able to find much. So this is kind of my hypothesis at this point. All right, next question is from Everett. Great talk, Jason. I really love the visuals and those cute cartoons. Um, I was wondering, it looked like it uh, beta pick, not only was it a subsolar C to O, it looked like also a subsolar uh, metallicity overall, overall abundance. I was wondering if you could comment on like if that's significant and uh, might, again, it's always speculative whether it could be connected to formation in some way. Yeah, yeah, no, good point. It's, it's definitely speculative. Uh, with one planet, it's always very hard to say very much. It's really looking at the population that's going to tell us a lot about the about these uh, compositions, I think the comp I think the metallicity is super so uh, solar because um, the the Fe over H is above one above okay. zero. Yeah, it's oh, a log, sorry, I didn't log, see. I... It's log Fe over H and not log C to O, so it's a little bit confusing in that regard. <laughs> okay, okay, so it's super solar. Okay, so kind of consistent with. Yeah, it's planet. consistent with like this like additional post you know formation accretion of solids or something at the end. Okay, thank you. All right. Do we have any other questions for Jason? I'm not seeing any. Uh, so I would like to invite everyone to uh, unmute and thank our speaker for a wonderful talk. And we will see you here next week.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.